Good morning. My name is Matt Carling. Do my own introduction. I'm a, an architect within a team within Cisco called the Security and Trust Organization. And some of you may have already attended uh, some previous sessions uh, run for the Netacad program called Find Yourself in the Future. So this is also, today is also the third in that series. And, you know, Earl sort of presented a bit of the uh, attacker landscape and, you know, the methods uh, that they use. And I'm sort of going to pivot to, you know, the defender's uh, side of the picture. And more, you know, what's the big holistic picture or how should we approach this? So before we start, just introduce two concepts that I want to leave with you today. The first is, oh, did I jump too far? Just go back one. Oh. Ah, sorry, my slides just got swapped around on me. Defensible, so the ability to, to defend something. And the second one is defense in depth, okay? Like a layered approach uh, to security. So, you know, we can't be reliant on just, say, one security feature to protect us. That might, you know, nothing is 100% effective. So we need, you know, multiple things uh, to protect us. You know, you'll have, you know, antivirus and strong passwords and, and firewalls and other things. So we build this layered model. So the analogy is to uh, like a castle approach when we're talking about defense in depth or layered security. And see, this is a picture of uh, Bomaris Castle, just stand over your way there. Um, it's, it's somewhere in Wales, I haven't been to Wales, but um, I've flown over it uh, thanks to uh, Google Earth. And one thing I do like about it from a, a top-down view is you can see the layered defense approach. This was built sometime in around 1280, 1284. I'm not a, a big history uh, student. Um, but you can see, uh, you know, we've got a moat, we've got an outer wall, then an inner wall, there's some turrets, and I assume if it wasn't in ruins, there'd be a, an inner keep where the, where the gold was kept. So you can see, you know, uh, an attacker to get in, uh, you know, has to, you know, do some swimming, climb over a couple of walls, and no doubt there are arrows firing down, we've all seen movies. So that's sort of like the, the layered approach. And that, that applies to security space. But it's not a matter of just doing that, it's also about how do we operationalize that and make it defensible. You know, we could build a massive, massive wall around our castle, but if we don't have enough sentries to, to go around and be lookouts, you know, it's difficult to defend. And that's where, you know, I'd introduce things like frameworks, where we look at, well, what's the life cycle or what's the operational model behind cybersecurity? So this one's from NIST, which is a, a US National Institute of Standards and Technology. And see, they've got a framework around identifying assets, how are you going to protect how are you going to detect? How are you going to respond and recover? So it really makes the defender's point of view, uh, you know, that's the life cycle of what you do. And as, as Earl pointed out, there's lots of roles when we go into the depths and different skill sets required uh, in each of these different elements. So just start on defense in depth and, and layered defense. So, you know, we're looking at anatomy of attack video and say, so, you know, simplistically, we've got our, our, our baddie, our black hat, out on the internet, he's got some malware, or she, and that wants to deliver to our users and inside our organization. So many people say, well, oh, great, let's stick a firewall in the way, okay? And that's great, you know, but as Earl pointed out, you know, we like DNS to come in and out of our organization. So, you know, trusted protocol, yeah, we, we let that through. So we need some additional layers. So we might say, oh, let's put some, some antivirus on our endpoints, okay? That's great, but we need more layers and say, you know what? Just sending packets in and out of the network is not the only way. Maybe we need to cover our email. We just had a phishing attack in that demo. Um, maybe it's a web browser or some web exploit, so we need to cover our web channels because there's multiple ways in and out of the organization. Maybe we'll put on some identity services. Oh, let's I'll just keep on going. Maybe we'll put malware uh, detection everywhere. Um, you know, we want this DNS vector. We'll put some DNS protection. You know, so Cisco's a solution called Umbrella. So you can see we start putting multiple layers of defense, and here's our equivalent of the castle, okay? So now our, our black hat has to, you know, defeat multiple layers. So should any one of those fail, um, you know, hopefully we'll detect them somewhere else. And it also depends where they are in the life cycle of their attack. So the world would be great if it was just simple, where the, the black hats are out here and all, all our data and our users were nicely tucked away inside the organization. But of course, it's not like that today. In fact, we want to move all our data into cloud services. Our users like to be mobile. I mean, everyone's got mobile devices. We want to work from home. We want to work from coffee shops. 
Uh, so we need to say, well, we need to extend that layered approach you know, all over the organization. And so we end up building something like this. Okay, so how do we layer on different detection mechanisms, uh, you know, no matter where our users are and whenever, wherever our gold or our data goes? And of course, all those pipes flowing in between, apart from the, the black hat, of course, we need to protect that data. So that's where we have, you know, encryption. We encrypt our data as we move it over the internet or we use VPNs. So this is sort of like the defense in depth process. So there's a few anatomy of attack videos, and I, I focused on a, a, a different one, but the, the concept is still the same. So whilst we just watched one on a, a phishing attack, I'll build this one out. There's another anatomy of attack video, a series of these, where it's a website compromise. Okay, so our, our malicious actor, actor at home uh, compromised a website and put some, you know, some sort of attack or some sort of vulnerability on that site and uh, did cross-site scripting attack and some malicious script that our employee then goes and visits that site. Okay, so he's, this person, uh, Richard, uh, is using his corporate laptop and uh, he's actually a member of a bowling club. And so he was logging on to check where they're sitting on the, in the league, uh, if you go and watch this video later. Uh, his machine gets compromised um, by, you know, there's some vulnerability on his machine. And a bit like in the previous video, then there's a, a command and control uh, session set up. So some sort of shell goes back to our attacker, and now we've got that admin control. Of course, in this case, Richard goes back into to his company, uh, which is uh, Opticon, uh, and now our, our attacker's got some sort of presence inside uh, that, that business. In that video, they start scanning around saying, well, what can I find now I'm inside? Okay, And one of the key things they find is some building uh, automation systems, and specifically uh, a thermostat that they can see uh, from, from this laptop. And they use that to maintain a foothold. So they want to be able to come back into this organization over and over again. So that's the foothold for our malicious attacker, who then scans around the network at their leisure and eventually finds some, some blueprints you know, related to the company, so the, the truly high-value IP or, or their, their gold in our, in our castle uh, model and they exfiltrate that and they you know, sell it to competitors. So we'll come back to this, but how would a layered defense approach and also a defensible approach uh, help in this case? So I introduced defensible and I showed this, this life cycle before around what are the different phases and you, know, you can go through and read there or maybe in a very small font, you know, the types of activities we need to do at different phases. And it starts off with you know, identifying what it is we're trying to protect. Okay, so we, we don't know what's on our networks or where our data is, it's very difficult to, to stop anyone taking it away. Uh, we look at, once we know that, how do we protect it? If somebody's then trying to, um, to steal it or access it, we need to be looking. So we need those sentries on the towers looking for people scaling our walls. And then we need a response. You know, sometimes this happens very, very quickly. You know, the, the attackers can be in and out. Um, so, you, you know, if, you, if you're taking days in this uh, process, and our attackers are taking hours or minutes, um, you know, everything will be gone before you notice. And then ultimately, how to recover. Okay, and we can see in the, in the phishing example, you know, recovery from them was paying the ransom. Obviously, they perhaps didn't have a great backup regime. Now, I mean, there's, you know, Cisco has, has put this out, and so I like this one around, what do you do before the attack, during the attack, and after the attack? It's the same process around trying to think of it as a life cycle, and how do you operationalize security? So just pull out in the time we've got, just like, well, what are some key things about making our layered approach defensible? And so it's defense in depth with asset management. So knowing what, it, what you own and where it is. It's alerts with context, okay? We, I heard in a, a presentation at Cisco Live this week that 50% of security alerts are never investigated because people are just truly overwhelmed. So we need, we need to look at things like, oh, how does automation and orchestration which I've got up there, uh, help. Also, monitoring and visibility. So, you know, in the uh, Earl's example, you know, we were, if there was a compromise, and we were letting DNS flow in and out of our organization, as you do, because you need DNS to use the internet. But it was being abused. It was a trusted protocol, and you might have heard of the phrase, hiding in plain sight. So there's lots of things on your network that you expect, you know, HTTPS, TLS sessions, you expect DNS, you expect network time protocol, there's all these you know, underlying protocols 
uh, both you know, at the network layer and application layer that are, are normal. So attackers try and hide inside these, and so you need to uh, look more closely at it. Key one is segmentation. Reducing your attack service and some good hygiene. Okay, so in, in my example, why was the laptop even able to even able to see a thermostat? I mean, there's no business reason for those IP addresses to be able to communicate. So things like segmentation is a, is a really key approach. And you know, for any of you who are you know in Netacad and been doing uh, you know the networking side of things, you know, network security is a huge piece of cybersecurity because you know ultimately. Is an IPv4 or an IPv6 packet often underneath everything, whether that be you know, legitimate business traffic or malicious traffic. And lastly, and this is really what uh, Earl's organization is around, how can you benefit from threat intelligence? So asset management, this is from a, a survey. You can pull this from Cisco's annual security report. We won't jump through all the numbers, but the key point on this slide is if you look at the top line, you can see for these different Sectors, government, healthcare, tech, finance, the number of endpoints that they thought they had on their networks. And the second line is, well, when they went and did a discovery, well, what did they really find? Okay, so there's some pretty, you know, big gaps here between what I know, and if I know about it, I can defend, versus what I don't know, and hence I have no idea if it's, you know, being defended or not. And so visibility of your assets is, is a key point. You can see some things here, you know, unmanaged networks. Okay, uh, this last one here, other paths to the internet. So in my simple example at the start, we thought, oh great, we've got this internet gateway, we'll lock it down with this layered approach. You know, when they go look and say, well, we've got all these other ways of communicating to the internet that we didn't even know about. Who's looking at those? So visibility and knowing your environment is key. So that extends to things like device in uh, inventory, but also where your data is. Uh, who are you people? Who's got access? What are their roles? What's, what's your infrastructure? What's the status of it? So, you know, these are some of the things in that identify phase that you need to be aware of. I mentioned alerts with com uh, context, and uh, yep, those are my little glasses boxes, just blocking out some, some data, because uh, this, this is, you know, from a, 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 an actual network. And this is looking at you know, some data coming out of uh, Cisco Umbrella, which is that DNS protect service. And the, the point is not, okay, that someone's trying to reach some, some sites or some domain names which are deemed as being serving malware, uh, but if all you got back was, hey, someone in my organization is trying to access this site which is known to host malware, well, what do I do, right? That's, that's, that's a great piece of information, but I can't operationalize it. And this is where we need to enrich the data with some additional context. And so, oh, well, let's share the, the IP address, okay? Okay, at least now I, I can hunt down the host on my, on my network. But that's still, how do I know, do you know what IP address you're using right now? I don't. So, you know, you have to start looking through logs. And so we can enrich that further and say, you know what? I'm going to identify and pull out the Active Directory username. So if this is an enterprise deployment, you can pull out their, their, their Windows AD username. And now I can say, oh, it's malware. I blocked it, which is great. And over here, you know, I've blanked out the rest of the username, but now you can go say, oh, who's that person? Jump on the phone, ring them up, you know, go do that, that respond and recover phase. So really key to, you know, helping defenders keep pace uh, with the number of threats. And this is touching on the same thing. You know, I, I mentioned, you know, I, I can't remember the, the tens or hundreds of thousands that, that mo of alerts or uh, that most organizations get on their, on their security dashboards. Um, and they can't get round to all of them. And so a key piece, and you know, as you, know, you graduate and move in, if you're moving into the security space, things like automation, integration, and orchestration are going to be key, especially with the billions of IoT devices uh, that are going to be connecting to the internet. So how can we better share intelligence between our detection and our response tools, potentially automate them, or at least make it simple and quick for our responders to, uh, you know, close that, that time to contain, mean time to contain uh, metric that many uh, organizations track. Monitoring and visibility. So maybe from the first slide, you got the impression everything goes around, how do we stop them getting in? But ultimately, they might still find a path in because we didn't, you know, they found a path we weren't aware of, we didn't have complete visibility. Uh, so maybe we want to have visibility of them on the way out. 
Okay, so even in the phishing one, they extracted those uh, business files. Certainly, in my example, you know, they were stealing blueprints. And so we can look at, you know, nothing moves on a network without leaving a fingerprint. Okay, so if you're shifting an IP packet, well, that IP packet, you know, left a trace, a fingerprint. You know, for, for Cisco, you know, that's NetFlow records. So if you're already looking at NetFlow in your studies, we can use that as a, an indicator or, you know, forensic records of what happened. And we can start analyzing that and say, you know, that DNS traffic is legitimate, but when I, when I look at it, it, it doesn't look like DNS or the frequency is wrong or it's going to a, a strange destination or we're running a reputation service over the top of that and that's a known malicious site or it looks like it's created by a, 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 genera a domain name generation algorithm. So we can get all these hints as, you know, this flow, although it's a trusted protocol, uh, is suspicious. And similar if we see, you know, you know, people say, oh, we've lost gigs and tens, if not terabytes of data. Well, that all leaves fingerprint on the network. So if you're watching that, you can say, why is terabytes of data leaving my organization? It might be a trusted protocol, um, but, you know, that shouldn't be happening. And so we can do a lot of things at that monitoring and visibility level. Key thing also is around segmentation. So I mentioned, you know, my example is all around that he got the attacker got the foothold in the thermostat. Why could the thermostat get to blueprints in that organization? Okay, we don't have to have big flat networks. Okay, so it's again when you know your devices, you know your assets. We can now say, well, let's let's use some technology. There's various ways of achieving it, but let's segment our network. So our thermostat probably should only talk to the the thermostat cloud service or the or the controller. Our laptops probably should only speak to our servers. Uh, you know, our printers maybe shouldn't speak to the internet. Depends how clever they are. And if they do speak there, to a limited subset, you know, the, the printer vendor perhaps for ordering new ink. Uh, so once we have this model, you know, this strategy around how we should segment our network, you know, we can enforce that with technology, okay? And so that, that lateral propagation and gaining footholds, at least it's contained, okay? And we, you know, that'll stop a, help prevent uh, a lot of uh, escape vectors. Now, in, in both cases, in the, in the, in the phishing incident and in, in my uh, web uh, compromise example, you know, there's some reliance on they did something on the endpoint. Maybe the user still ran something, but it was still malicious software. Maybe the user didn't have to click on something and they just visited a compromised website at which exploited a vulnerability in their browser. And so this is actually from within Cisco around we have a, a trusted device uh, process. Around if, if you can meet these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, if I'm counting correctly, nine requirements and things like do I have hard drive encryption or storage encryption? Do I have current antivirus? You know, is my operating system, you know, whether it's Windows or Mac or Linux, is it up got the latest patches? And same with the applications that run on top of it. If you can answer yes to all of these, well, Cisco IT will, will say, yes, you're trusted, and we'll let you get access to that gold in the center of the castle or, you know, the data. If we fail any of those, you know, we're, our trust is diminished, and we'll have some sort of restricted access. Perhaps we can't get on at all, can't get on the network at all until we've, you know, patched our device. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here, <laughs> uh, you know, because I, I like to, you know, as Earl said, one of the things is, you know, users, you know, there's a phrase, users are the weak link, all right? So, you know, as, as users and whether, you know, as, as citizens, as students, as, as you, um, people in business, focus on, you know, think before you click, patch, use good password hygiene, because um, some of that is what I come back to in the, in the hygiene section. Great slide, because I just mentioned hygiene. This is a statistic that just released um, from this office of the Australian Information Commissioner. So you may or may not be aware, we have breach notification legislation in Australia. Uh, so organisations need to you know, report when, when they've lost data. And uh, when you drill down into the stats, there's a really long URL there if you like reading uh, statistical papers. Uh, but if you look at the, the breaches which weren't accidental and due to human error, but were actually deemed as malicious, Three quarters of those, so the, the red piece, the blue, and the, the teal, you can see they're all related to credentials, right? So whether they were fished, like, like the video we saw, whether they'll just like, you know, I just call them dumb passwords, you know, they were short and they got brute forced, 
uh, or whether stolen or compromised by some other method, you know, most of the breaches in Australia uh, that were reported in the last quarter aren't related to exploiting vulnerabilities. It's getting access just through credentials. And this is what I say is just one of the things around good hygiene. And the, the last piece is around threat intelligence. And obviously, Earl's covered uh, a lot of this around, you know, each year there's a few annual security reports. The, the Cisco one is always uh, good to read. Uh, and there's uh, elements that have been published of, on it already. Uh, I'm sure you can find it by navigating our, our website. Uh, Verizon data breach report is another one that contains a lot of good trending statistics. And one of the things they put out is most organizations that are breached are alerted by someone else other than themselves, okay? So it's, it's a national cert or it's a, you know, a, a threat uh, group such as Talos or someone else who alerts them that they have a problem. Uh, and so, you know, when, if you go into the cybersecurity uh, area, you need to draw on, you know, the wisdom of the masses or the community intelligence model. And so organizations like Talos with their massive uh, sensor and telemetry networks, uh, other, other sources from, from government, other alerts, to, to help you be informed about whether active campaigns and current threat landscape. Click. So I'll just quickly touch, I'm, I'm coming up at the time, and this was my scenario about the, the cross-site scripting attack around if we overlay our layered defense and a defensible network approach to that, could we have stopped that attack? And you could, in your own minds, think about how this applies to phishing. So my, my initial web compromise, you know, I can't do much about their website. Hey, it's a bowling alley, but I can do something about my employees' laptops. So perhaps they should have been running some DNS protection software. Perhaps I should have had antivirus. Perhaps their browser needed patching or their operating system. Maybe they should have been using a VPN all the time. There are a number of defensive techniques that perhaps could have stopped the attack at that very first stage. But even if it failed and we went through to the next phase, you know, if we're running, if people are running command and control shells over your network, well, if you're running visibility tools, you should see that, right? So perhaps there's something we can do with NetFlow telemetry, or maybe the, the actor was using DNS themselves for as part of their reach back. So perhaps, you know, DNS security may have stopped that phase, but maybe it didn't. So maybe we're still here and the device is now scanning the network. I said, you can't scan a network without leaving a footprint, a fingerprint on the network. So again, maybe network telemetry would have said, hey, why is um, Richard's laptop scanning every IP address in the organization? That's a bit weird. That's not what he does every day. Uh, so maybe there would have been an alert there. Already mentioned segmentation. Maybe you shouldn't have found the, the controller in the first place. Maybe that thermostat should have been in its own uh, you know, dedicated VLAN, isolated from everything else. And certainly, if our thermostat starts scanning the network, well, that's very strange indeed. Again, anomalous behavior that you know, we could detect. Hopefully, you can see that potentially there's something in our layered defense approach, as well as knowing our assets and an approach to like operationalizing security that maybe they would never have had the exfil, maybe the phishing attack never would have actually got ransomware. So with that, I'll leave you with this, that you know, when you, you're looking at cybersecurity and uh, I know there's a huge uh, component of that and the NETICAD program that it's a combination of both the layered approach and the technologies, but it's how you all tie it together uh, and, uh, you know, have some success as a defender. So with that, I thank you for your time.